how many of you, when you were younger, attended children's church or Sunday school or something like that? Just raise your hand. You attended children's church or Sunday school. This is very much like uh, the hands raised this morning. A lot of hands all across the sanctuary raised. And then now, as an adult, you were in church. I think this says something to the importance of us as parents in keeping our children engaged and involved in church throughout their childhood. Of course, kids get older, leave the house, they make their own choices, and that's on them. Uh, but wonderful to see so many of you that were active and engaged in the Sunday school and children's church as a kid. Sunday school is a place where God's Word is systematically taught to children through the various age ranges of life. And one favorite way of communicating God's truth to kids is through questions and answers. So I remember as a kid, growing up at Midway Baptist Church in Waterloo, Michigan, various Sunday school teachers would use questions and answers in different ways. Sometimes it was just a straight, here's a question, who can answer it? And hands go up all over the room trying to be the first one to answer it. As kids get older, you've got to have more incentive, especially with boys, to keep them active and engaged. So usually it was some kind of a competition. So we, we wanted to win. We wanted to get first place. And sometimes the competition got a little intense, especially when I got to my sixth grade year, because then the teacher was pulling out all the stops. He would give out a quarter, 25 cents, for every correct answer that you got in the review quiz. And, you know, me being a kid who grew up in a Christian home with Parents that read from the picture Bible every night. I knew a lot of facts about the Bible, so I come home with a couple of bucks after Sunday school. <laughs> uh, always, always sure to put a quarter in the offering plate, you know. Uh, but I, you know, did pretty well in those classes in Sunday school. <coughs> now, whether you attended every week like me or only haphazardly like some kids, nearly every kid pretty quickly comes to understand that there is a secret to getting about half or more of the questions right in Sunday school. You know what the secret is? Jim, you're looking at me quizzically. I'm going to tell you the secret <laughs> to how to get almost half of the answers right in Sunday school. When you don't know the answer, Jesus? Yes! <laughs> That's correct! It's the classic Sunday school answer. Even on Wednesday night, the kids tried that with me, and they'd be like, Jesus? And about half the time, they're right. So it's like, who was it that calmed the storm just by Jesus. speaking to it? Yeah. Little, little Billy raises his hand, Jesus? Yes, you're right. <laughs> little Susie, who was it that turned the water into wine? Ah, uh, was it Jesus? Yes, that's exactly right. And so on and so forth. Jesus. If you're not sure, if you're not sure, try Jesus. Have doubts? Jesus is the answer. As in children's Sunday school, so in life, Jesus, I've got to turn this thing on to make it work, Jesus is always the best answer. Jesus is always the best answer. Today in the life of Philip the Apostle, we'll see that Jesus isn't afraid of our questions. And Philip's questions take the form of objections. Jesus can handle our objections. In Him, we find what we see. Just like in Sunday school, Jesus is the answer to the questions in life. One time I heard a singer named Carmen perform. Remember Carmen? Anybody remember Carmen? A few hands. Okay, Christian contemporary artist from the 80s, Carmen. Uh, listen to his song, Champion, sometime. Wow, is that powerful. Carmen one time was explaining why people raised their hands in worship at his concert. And of course, there's that whole thing in the Bible about raising holy hands. I mean, it's kind of important to do what the Bible says, right? Raising holy hands in worship to our great God. But he made a good point. He said, you know, in school, what do you do when you know the answer? You raise your hand. And he said, that's why people should raise their hands when they worship. Because we as Christians know the answer. And the answer is? Jesus. Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. We're continuing our series on the 12 disciples whom Jesus called and set forth, set apart as apostles. To this point, we've had the opportunity to meet a couple of these disciples they look a little bit like me, right? But we met Peter, and we also met John, 
And then we had a chance to look closely at the life of James, and then last week, Andrew. Today we're going to consider Philip. Philip is another disciple from the fishing village of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. On the few occasions that Philip is mentioned, Andrew seems to be regularly nearby. So my guess is that maybe Andrew and Philip were kind of close. We learned last week how Andrew was kind of left out of the inner circle of three. It was Peter and James and John, and even though Andrew is Peter's brother, he's kind of left out. It seems like Andrew and Philip, maybe they grew up together, maybe they were good friends, but they always seemed to appear close beside each other as a team. One thing you should know about Philip, one thing you should know about Philip, the questioner we'll call him, can you read that? One thing you should know about Philip, he wasn't afraid to ask <laughs> questions and raise objections. He wasn't afraid to ask questions and raise objections. Let's take a closer look now at the life of Philip. If you were to take out a Bible concordance and look for the word Philip, you'd find quite a few places where the name Philip is mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospels and in Acts. It's important to realize that there's more than one Philip in the New Testament. In fact, there are four Philips in the New Testament. Four Philips in the New Testament. Two kings, one disciple, and one deacon. The kings were both sons of King Herod the Great, but by different wives. Now, if I was Herod the Great and I had sons by different wives, I don't think I would give them the same name. It just seems like you're going to get into a bunch of trouble doing that. But that's what Herod decided to do. So we have those Philips. Okay. We're not talking about those Philips. Then you have a Philip who is the disciple, numbered with the original twelve. He's the one we're talking about today. In the book of Acts, we encounter another Philip. This Philip is one of the original seven deacons. He is also a passionate evangelist, and we know about his evangelistic exploits in Samaria. And most notably, the story that many remember from Sunday school is of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip goes up to the chariot, says, what are you reading? He's reading from Isaiah. He doesn't understand who Isaiah is talking about. Philip says, well, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. Philip tells this Ethiopian official the good news about Jesus. The Ethiopian official believes. He says, look, there's some water right there on one side of the road. Why shouldn't I be baptized right now? He gets baptized. Philip is miraculously whisked away in the Holy Spirit. An incredible story of Philip the Evangelist. We're not talking about that Philip. And actually throughout church history, even some very famous church historians <coughs> have gotten the two Philips confused. We're talking about Philip from Bethsaida, the disciple of Jesus, one of the twelve uh, apostles, one of the twelve. That's the one we're talking about today. So let's consider a few glimpses into Philip's life as a disciple of Jesus. First of all, John chapter 1, verse 43 through 44. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 44. This is after John the Baptist has declared, Behold the Lamb of God. And two disciples heard him say this. Andrew, and most likely John. Andrew goes and gets Simon Peter, brings him to Jesus says, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Jesus changes Simon's name to Cephas, which means Peter. And then in verse 43, we encounter Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. <coughs> follow me. Now, Philip is the first one to hear those words from Jesus, at least as it's recorded for us in the Gospels. Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. Okay, first of all, follow me. Jesus found Philip, and Philip met the Savior. One thing we should know about Jesus as a rabbi is that he was different from other rabbis of that day. Generally, <coughs> rabbis of that day would make a name for themselves 
And then as they made a reputation for themselves, would-be disciples would come around them and essentially apply to become their disciples, rabbis in training, being mentored by the great well-known rabbi. In the case of Jesus, it's not the disciples who takes the initiative, it's Jesus who takes the initiative and calls to Philip saying, follow me. Jesus found Philip, and Philip met the Savior. And then what does Philip do next? Well, much like Andrew, Philip is a natural evangelist. He's excited. He's been waiting to meet the Messiah. And now he's met him. So he's not going to keep it to himself. He's going to take that good news to others. And so he takes the good news to Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Isn't it interesting how we always talk just like Philip does? I found Jesus. We even sing songs like, I found Jesus. When really it's we who are lost and it's he who found us. But from a human perspective, we found him. We found him of whom the prophets wrote. He's talking about the Messiah who was to come. We found him, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel says to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It's a pretty good question. Wait a minute, Nazareth? <coughs> Backwater, little town, a couple thousand people. Nazareth, that's not mentioned in the prophecies. And at this point, Philip doesn't have quite enough information to refute what is a pretty basic question. But what does he say? What does Philip say to Nathaniel? He says, come and see I love this as an example to us. You see, there's a lot of times where I think we shy away from telling people about Jesus or introducing people to Jesus because we don't think we'll be able to answer some of their hard questions that they have for us. And so we're a little nervous, a little scared. Uh, notice that none of those inhibitions slowed down Philip's excitement. And when Nathaniel asks him a good question that Philip doesn't yet have enough knowledge to answer, I mean, the natural response would be what? Well, actually, he was born in Bethlehem, just like the prophet said. But Philip doesn't have enough information yet to give him this good answer, so what does he say? He just says, come on, come and see, come and meet Jesus. I think it's a great example for us as Christians. We don't have to answer every question, we don't have to have this great theological discourse or this well-reasoned and tight logical argument to refute every single person who's against God and Christianity. We just need to live as salt and light. And it's a simple invitation. Okay, good question. You know what? I'll look that up. I'll ask my pastor. I'll ask somebody who's really smart. I'll go to gotquestions.org and try to see what I can find. There really is a website called gotquestions.org. It's got some great answers to your Bible questions, by the way. But what does Philip say? He just says, come and see. Come and see. An older Bible commentary writer named William Barclay tells a story of an English house gathering where some people got together at a country home for an extended stay throughout the long weekend, and Sunday came. And everybody got ready to go to the local country church, except for one person. He was a noteworthy agnostic, somebody who's not sure about the idea of God and even tends towards hostility towards the idea of God. And he was known for being super smart and always reasoning anybody into a corner. As everybody's getting ready for church, he approaches his one friend, who he knows is a Christian, and he says, Would you mind staying home from church today and just explaining to me a little bit about Jesus and why you're a follower of Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And the guy, kind of like a deer in the headlights, kind of a simple guy, a simple person of faith, just said, you know what, I, I know that you'll argue me into a corner. I don't want to take that abuse. I'm going to go to church. And the guy says, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to get into all that. I just want you to tell me what it means for you to be a Christian. Essentially, he's saying, introduce me to this Jesus that you follow. And so the man for the next hour or so tells him his story of how Jesus changed his life and how he trusted in Jesus as his Savior. He died on the cross for my sins and he saved me and I have a hope and a future and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And at the end of it, the agnostic was in tears. 
not willing yet to repent and turn to Jesus as his Savior, but he was in tears because he said, man, I really want what you have. And that's a question for us to consider. The way we talk about Jesus and the way we live, we may not be able to answer every question, but do those around us want what we have? Do they say to themselves, you know, I don't understand this whole Christianity thing, but man, I want what Jason's got. I wish I had that peace in the storm. I wish I, wish I had what he's got. Or do people look at us and say, I don't want any part of that. Think about it. When it comes to Philip, he just says, come and see. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Interestingly enough, as one author writes, he saw himself as a channel rather than a destination. In other words, he knew that God's blessing flowed to him, and he was going to channel that blessing to others. Many of us are kind of like the Dead Sea where the water flows in and it stops with us. We need to be channels of blessing to others. The blessing comes from God to us. We channel that blessing to others. The story continues about Philip. A few chapters later in John, one we looked at last week, we won't look at it in great detail, but John chapter 6. John chapter 6, Philip apparently is a really practical guy and he makes a pretty good point. Jesus is teaching the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd follows him. They've seen the signs and wonders he's been doing. They're listening to him teach. 5,000 men plus women and children. Approximately up to 20,000 people gathered around Jesus. Verse 5 of John 6, lifting up his eyes, seeing a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And Jesus said this to test him. Philip must have been a kind of practical guy, maybe kind of quick with numbers, and Jesus isn't just playing with him here. He wants to test him to give him an opportunity to grow in his faith. And Philip says to Jesus... Answers him, verse 7, 200 denarii. Now, a denarii is about a day's wages. So, 200 days' wages worth of bread would not be enough for each one of them to get just a little. So, if I gave up the next half a year plus of my wages, it wouldn't be enough for this whole crowd to get just a little teeny piece of bread. And then we learned the rest of the story last week how Andrew brings up the boy with two fishes and some loaves of bread. Jesus multiplies them, and everybody is fed. They all have their full. Jesus does this incredible miracle. But Philip's comment serves, literary experts would call it as a foil, but it serves as a sense of magnifying what Jesus is about to do. It's a very practical kind of guy. He makes a good point. But what Philip and the other disciples learn in this miracle is that impossible circumstances and overwhelming odds are nothing when Jesus is present. Impossible circumstances and overwhelming odds are nothing when Jesus is present. A lot of us face similar economic hardships. <coughs> There's a task to be done. And we want to help, we want to be a part of it, but we have a sense of, <clears throat> my economic limitations will not allow me to do this. It could be obeying the Lord in the area of tithing and giving of offerings and that sort of thing. It could be obeying the Lord in the area of giving Him control over our finances and being stewards of all that we have and of all that we are and realizing none of it belongs to me. It's not about me. It's about God and His purposes for me. It all comes from Him anyway. Maybe for us as a church, there are things that God is calling us to do. And we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit in those things. Not saying, well, you know, we can't do that. We don't have enough manpower, woman power. We don't have enough kid power. We don't have enough resources of time and money to be able to accomplish that. I remember several years ago, we as a church thought we could never pull off a vacation Bible school. We thought there's no way that our church could host a successful vacation Bible school. But God clearly was saying to us, vacation Bible school. And we knew it was his plan for our church. And so we prayed about it. We took a step of faith. And there were those practical people who said, we can't do it. We can't do it. 
But by God's grace, we did. And Vacation Bible School, for me, has become one of the highlights of the entire church year. It's so exciting to see people pulling together and using their time, even asking for time off of work to be a part of Vacation Bible School. It's just an awesome thing. And I'm so thankful to see how it all comes together. But like Philip, we learn that impossible circumstances and overwhelming odds mean nothing when Jesus is present. John chapter 14, fast forward now to John chapter 14. This is after the Last Supper. I believe they're still in the upper room. Philip makes a confirmation request. We'll get to that in just a moment. Jesus has just said some troubling words. He's told them that he's about to depart. He's told them that Peter the rock is about to deny him. Their hearts are troubled. So what does Jesus say in John 14 and verse 1? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says to him, Lord, Lord, uh, raises his hand. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Brave enough to ask the question. Of Jesus. And Jesus says, Look, you do know the way because you know me. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Then Philip makes a bold request, like Moses in the Old Testament who desired to see the Lord. Isaiah had the privilege of seeing a vision of God's incredible majesty and glory. <clears throat> Philip makes a bold request. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. You ever met someone, or maybe yourself at times, been like, God, give me a sign. Show me some big grand thing so I know you're there, I know you're real, I, I know that this is all true. Show me a sign, Lord, and I'll believe, and I'll obey, and I'll follow. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. <coughs> Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you then say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Jesus says, look, you want to see the Father? I and the Father are one. You want to know the way? I am the way, says Jesus. You want to see the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus answers Philip's bold request, reminding him that to know and see Jesus is to know and see the Father. One more story about Philip in the Gospels, back in John chapter 12. This is just after the triumphal entry this is another story where Philip's life and Andrew's life <coughs> intersect as they did in John 1, as they did in the feeding of the 5,000. So here, John chapter 12 and verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Philip has a Greek name. Bethsaida appears to have been a multicultural, multilingual sort of city. And so these Greeks know that if they want to approach Jesus, they need to talk to Philip first. Philip speaks their language. They go and they talk to Philip. Philip talks to Andrew. And together... They're introduced to Jesus. <laughs> Philip's Greek name and multilingual abilities clear the way for Greeks to meet Jesus. You know, Philip is the only apostle for whom history claims that he took the gospel to the Gauls in France. He took the gospel to France. He's also closely linked with Hierapolis, which was a city in western Turkey, just outside the circle of the seven churches to whom John wrote the book of Revelation. Hierapolis was known for its pagan worship. 
they had these springs there, mineral springs, that were said to have some kind of magical, spiritual quality. And there were priests, and they made quite a living by the tourists who would come to Hierapolis to seek to be healed from their sicknesses. Now you can imagine what happened when Philip starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. People start to turn from their wicked ways. People start to turn from this pagan spirituality and emphasis on magical healings and that kind of thing. And pretty soon that sector of business in Hierapolis begins to go south. And Philip's not very popular. Now Philip and the other apostles, just like Paul, they preached Christ and Christ crucified. That was their message. So guess how the officials loved to persecute them, torture them, and put them to death. They said, you want to preach Christ crucified? We'll crucify you. And so Philip, like so many of the other twelve, was crucified on a cross, just as his Savior was crucified. But history tells us that to his dying breath, he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Calling out to those around him to repent from their sins, to turn from their wicked ways, and turn in faith to Jesus. You know, one thing about Philip, Nathaniel, even Thomas, and the other disciples, they weren't afraid to ask questions of and about Jesus. When anywhere from five to 20,000 people needed to be fed in a remote place, Philip wondered how they could get the job done with limited resources. At the end of Jesus' ministry, after the Last Supper, just before the Passion of the Cross, Philip wants confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is. I imagine most of us can relate. I think we can relate. There's been times in our life that we felt that we could not do what God wanted us to do because our resources of time and money and talent and ability were too limited. But I love what Billy Graham says. He says, where God guides, he provides. And where he leads, he supplies all needs. So if God is guiding, he will provide. And if God is leading, he will supply your needs. He will never call you to a job for which does not also give you the abilities and the resources to get that job done. I wonder what objections we raise, what questions we might have for Jesus. Maybe your objections are kind of like those of Philip. Sometimes our questions are more like, why? Why did this happen? Or how? How am I ever going to do this? Or where? Where do you want me to go, Lord? Sometimes our questions are, why not? God, I've been praying, I've been asking, why not? I want to encourage you to ask those questions and to bring your question to Jesus. Jesus isn't afraid of your question. Jesus isn't afraid of your objections. And so I would encourage you, go ahead and ask. Go ahead and ask. He's not afraid of your questions. He can handle your objections. In Him, you'll find the answer that you seek. Because just like in that children's Sunday school class so many years ago, <clears throat> Jesus is the answer to every question. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Jesus is always, always the best answer. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We have honest questions. We have real objections. But God, we bring those to Jesus. And we know that He will not turn us away. God, we thank You that He is the answer to the question of life. That He is the one who gives life purpose and meaning. And following Him, there is no greater path. And so we thank You for His call upon our lives. And we thank you that we can bring our question to him who is the answer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
desire of our hearts, you may be seated. We come now to the special time each month that we set aside a few moments to do as Jesus has commanded us. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of which we partake reminds us of